Good morning, Stanford. Thank you, John and Laconia, um, for such a warm introduction. It's a true joy and honor to be here with you today um, and to be charged with the task of bringing you the word. I'm certainly grateful for the ways this congregation supported me while I lived here in Connecticut and I'm delighted to join you again in this way today. I'm continuing in the sermon series on Acts chapters 1 through 15 and we'll be looking at Acts 4 verse 31 today. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. I hope I'm not being too bold to say that being filled with the Holy Spirit is something we don't quite know what to do with in the Church of Christ. The Holy Spirit is not something that is as explicitly emphasized in our tradition as it is in others, which is not necessarily a bad thing, it just is. So I'm excited to unpack this verse with you all today. The Book of Acts is an overlooked book when it comes to the development of Christian doctrine. Historically, theologians have preferred the words of Paul in the later books as more prescriptive for the church, as more worthy of theological reflection. Acts is a book that documents the physical acts of the apostles. It is a record of what the apostles did, how they healed, how they moved, what they taught, and where they walked. It is the apostles' acts that corroborate the story of the resurrected Savior in his absence. I see their acts as embodied theology, what they physically did with what they know about who Jesus is. Disability theologian Nancy Eisland invites us to consider embodiment as a source of theological reflection in her book, The Disabled God. Embodiment as a source of theological reflection is a helpful framework to think about what is happening with the church in Acts. Maybe the apostles' action in the world is as important, perhaps in a different way, as the words of Paul. Acts tells the story of the birth and development of the early church, a movement energized by the Holy Spirit and led by Peter and the apostles. The apostles and early believers grapple with their relationship to both their Jewish heritage and their Greco-Roman culture. Acts unfolds according to a plot of action and reaction. The apostles perform these miracles and then endure this punishment. The early believers gather in these ways and the religious authorities react in this negative way. And it's within this dynamic dialectic between action and reaction, that the early church grows and defines itself. Acts 4 places us with Peter and John as they are arrested for teaching about the resurrection, tried by the authorities, and ultimately released. They return to their friends, more than relieved to be among like-minded individuals, I'd imagine. They pray together evoking the Psalms of David, interpreting what they're experiencing as a community according to tradition. They pray, Sovereign Lord, it is you who said by the Holy Spirit through our ancestor David, the kings of earth took their stand, and the rulers have gathered together against the Lord. The believers connect their experience as a persecuted grassroots social movement to the struggles their ancestor David faced. Though Christians, at least in America, are no longer a persecuted minority, we can connect with how they processed their afflictions. We interpret what we're experiencing now as a community according to the traditions to which we belong. We look back at ancient words to enlighten current events, to guide our path forward. Now and then, blurred together within a sacred tradition. When the group finishes praying, the place in which they were gathered was shaken, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God with boldness. It's unclear exactly what they say when filled with the Holy Spirit, but we know it is mighty and it is inspired. 
A few verses back, the religious authorities interrogated and imprisoned Peter and John, asking them, by what power or by what name do you do this? They respond again, filled with the Holy Spirit, that they healed in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. There is a clear power struggle between the apostles and early believers with the religious authorities. By what power do you do these things, they ask, implying that if they want to do religious business in Jerusalem, they need to get a license from the temple power brokers. The religious authorities wanted people to be faithful and prayerful, but only in the prescribed ways of the law, under the exclusive banner of the temple and its protocols. With the introduction of the Holy Spirit in Acts, there is a new source of religious authority, one which cannot be regulated by existing rules and structures. The Holy Spirit democratizes the religious sphere, empowering ordinary men and women to speak boldly, to be their own spiritual authority. It's important to see the nuance in the early church's interactions with the established religious structures. It would be easy to see the movement of the Holy Spirit in Acts as license for an anti-institutional, spiritual but not religious, I am my own God kind of movement. However, this doesn't seem to be how the author of Acts sees the work of the Holy Spirit through the church. In fact, the early Christians are depicted as spending much time in the temple, as it says in Act 2, verse 46. Even more, the apostles know and appeal to scripture and to religious tradition. And the early church eventually organizes itself with Bible studies, meals, communal prayers, and financial accountability. The key issue in Acts, then, is not spiritual versus religious, but whether or not our religious institutions are responsive to the workings of the Spirit. It's important to note that too often we read into these texts undue criticism towards Judaism writ large. The Jewish leaders are always depicted as so focused on the letter of the law that they miss the point. And I lament these interpretations, which ironically miss the point. In our text today, I don't see criticism of Judaism as much as I see criticism of institutional structures that do not yield to the needs and authorities of their very constituents. A power structure that exists in iterations of every religion, including Christianity. As theologian Thomas Long writes, Whenever political or religious authorities set themselves up as the only legitimate brokers of authority, inevitably the Holy Spirit breaks down those structures. We see this modeled for us in Acts. There was a time when the Roman Empire forbade the marriage of slaves, but the Christian church, guided by the Spirit, encouraged and honored such marriages. There was a time when Jim Crow laws excluded African Americans from full participation in public life, but the Spirit summoned civil rights leaders to challenge these laws. The Spirit challenges authorities which control and manipulate and ushers movement towards more loving ends, towards more just relations. To be filled with the Holy Spirit evokes an image of water being poured out from God into us, vessels for divine activity. Throughout scripture and tradition, the Holy Spirit is also compared to fire or wind. Water, fire, wind, elements. Elements that we know by watching the news on any given day cannot be contained. Elements that do not always follow the structures we build to control them. Maybe Acts is urging us to consider how we build our institutions and communities. Do they work for or against the spirit? Do they bend with the movement of their people or do they break under pressure? 
To be filled with the Holy Spirit is to be connected to Jesus long after his ascension. It is the thing that remains in us when the feeling of love has left us. It holds both the memory of presence and the hope of return, and it grows in this absence, filling the cracks and crevices of separation with intimate connection to Jesus, to the work of the divine. What it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit today is as deep and as sacred a mystery as it was in the early church. The Holy Spirit has vexed theologians for centuries. I don't think it's controversial to say it's the least developed entity of the Trinity. In the Nicene Creed, the Orthodox Christian statement of belief, the Holy Spirit is almost tacked on to the end after a very thorough description of God the Father and Jesus the Son. The way the Holy Spirit moves and works is a mystery to us. And maybe that's for the best. We've interpreted its mystery in many ways. In some traditions, it's equivalent to speaking in tongues. In some, it's a gift received after baptism. Sometimes we refer to being led by the Spirit to do something or to say something. And sometimes it's used interchangeably with having a strong feeling or intuition about something. While this isn't necessarily wrong, I believe it's too simple. It does not capture the depth and mystery of a divine force which directs our being in the world. A gift given to empower lives of love and justice. To reduce it to an emotion or an explanation is like trying to pin down an effervescent and bubbly thing whose very constitution resists easy classification. It eludes our best words, just as it eluded the confines of the temple in Jerusalem. And despite its elusiveness, it flares up in real ways in words spoken by a caring teacher asking if I've ever considered divinity school, in social movements which turn unjust deaths into institutional accountability, in hearts that seek the promises of a new land and search for a better life for their children, the hope of a better life more powerful than the fears which hold us back. May we open our hearts and minds to be ready to receive the Holy Spirit whenever it chooses us. And may we yield to its demands of us, knowing that our communities and institutions need us to listen to it. May we let it work through us, knowing that if we do not, something else may take its place. Mend our communities, Heal our hearts and direct our steps, O Holy Spirit. Amen.